All right, we're going to go ahead and get started now because uh, we got a lot to cover and uh, we're already running a little bit late. Uh, but I just want to say happy Sabbath to everybody. Good to see you guys. And uh, let's just uh, start out with the word of prayer. Wonderful Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful to be gathered here today and to uh, study the subject of worship today uh, in education. Father, we just ask for your Holy Spirit's presence to be present amongst us, Father. We ask that our minds will be open and clear and able to receive your word and that you will guide us into all truth and understanding of this, this subject matter. May Jesus Christ be lifted up in this lesson, I pray in his precious name. Amen. Okay, so we're continuing our study. Um, on education in this week's study is lesson seven and it's worship in education and uh, I'm going to start off with the memory text as always and it's found in first chronicles 16 verse 29 and it reads give to the Lord the glory due his name bring an offering and come before him O worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness um, that'll come up in uh, a later study here today also. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly read through uh, Sunday. Um, it's not really a study anyway. It's usually just a, an opening to the lesson study. So I'm just going to read the whole thing so we can just move to Sunday and move forward. Uh, worship is part of humanity, part of human nature, even fallen human nature. No question we were created as beings who out of the freedom given us by God could worship the Lord because we love him and know that he is worthy of worship. Such worship must have been pretty easy in the pre-fall where humans had face-to-face -face access to God in creation unmarred by sin, death, and destruction. A creation that we who know only a fallen world can barely imagine. Today, of course, although the innate need to worship still exists in us, it, like everything else in this world, has been twisted and distorted by sin, which means that, among other things, we as worshiping beings can end up worshiping the wrong things or even end up not worshiping the Lord in the way that he is supposed to be worshiped. Um, and, of course, they give us the example in Mark, which uh, is the story um, with the Pharisees and Jesus when they complained to him about his disciples not washing their hands before they eat. And, uh, of course, Jesus calls him out on it. And uh, I'm just going to read verse 6 in, uh, in uh, Mark 7. And it says, He answered and said to them, Well did I say a prophesy about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honor me, honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So basically what was going on at that time, as most of us know, that uh, you know, they had an outward form of worship. It was all formalism. It was all the teachings and, and, and practices of men rather than the teachings of God. And this is why Jesus called them out on that. Uh, and that's really what this worship study is about. Um, you know, when we get to, uh, I think what is part of the focal point of this lesson is, uh, is Tuesday, where it talks about in spirit and truth. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Um, but let's move forward. Uh, the bottom, let me just finish reading the rest of it. It says, hence, because worship is so central to the Christian experience, Christian education must deal with the question of worship, the subject for this week's lesson. Okay. So any questions on what we just talked about? Okay, let's look at Sunday's lesson. We all worship something. Uh, and this is very true even today. Uh, when you think of even people that don't uh, belong to any um, relig religious sect or um, that don't proclaim God or Christianity in any way, uh, believe it or not, they still worship things. You know, worship is not necessarily... Uh, a religious thing. Uh, so the lesson points out that uh, it, it says uh, there's something in us, something no doubt that was originally woven into us by God and with everything else became warped by sin. So we all worship something and the lesson tells us that you know some people worship the sun, the moon, the stars, even today they, that practice still goes on. Um, 
you know, and they worship things like plants and rocks and, you know, God says all the things that he created are the things that people worship. Um, it says that, uh, you know, uh, some people even worship money, power, sex, themselves, rock stars, uh, all types of stars, uh, actors, politicians. Uh, we've seen that recently, you know, even today a lot of people will go around and wear maybe t-shirts or promoting everything uh, of their favorite politician. Uh, but here's the point of it, is whatever we focus, so the question first off would be, what is worship? What is worship? Okay, well the lesson tells us right here, it says, whatever we focus most of our attention on, whatever we live for, that is what we worship. So it really is, and especially for me and myself uh, with this lesson, you know, you really have to take a look. And in studying the Word of God, looking at the Word of God, it really helps point us out as to who we really are. Um, because oftentimes, you know, we, we don't really see that mirror. We don't look in the mirror to really see where we are in our walk with God, you know. And we might be fooling ourselves, unfortunately. Uh, so you really have to evaluate yourself and ask yourself, you know, do I spend most of my time here? And I don't mean here, but I mean, I'm just giving you an example of here and here. Or do I really focus most of my time and effort on this? And uh, I know I'm probably guilty myself, you know, because I have to really ask myself, where do I put my time and, and my studies? And but anyway, so moving forward. Uh, Daniel 3. Uh, most of us are familiar with Daniel and Daniel 3. It's, uh, it's the three Hebrews that, uh, yes. Oh, you had a question? Yeah, go ahead, brother. Sure. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, to even think that we might, you know, we're capable of even worshiping our loved ones, you know, our children, our spouses. Uh, we might not think that it's a bad thing, but, you know, you can put too much emphasis on that, too. You know, time and effort spent. Uh, so it can be anything. Anything can become our God. So in Daniel 3, uh, it's the story of the Hebrews that were told that they had to worship the golden image in Babylon, and they were told that they had to bow down and worship it, and they refused to bow down. We all know the story, I'm pretty sure. But um, the question asked, it says, uh, what does it teach us about the importance of true worship? So let's just take a look at it just briefly. Um, we don't have time to look at all of Daniel 3, obviously. But um, if we were to look at... Um, uh, of the narrative, which actually it doesn't give us the scriptures for it, it just says to look at Daniel 3. So the question asked once again is, what does it teach us about the true importance of worship? So what happened in the story? They were told they had to bow down. They refused to bow down to the image. First of all, why did they refuse to bow down to the image? Because of the commandments. Which, which commandment in particular? That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, you'll find it in Exodus 20. It's actually one of the Ten Commandments, as you mentioned. Um, and it just so happens to be the second commandment. And I'll just read it. You shall, not bow, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath, or that it is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iquity of the fathers upon the third and uh, of the, upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy unto thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So they knew this. You know, they weren't to bow down to anything, right? So again, what does it teach us about the importance of true worship? What ended up happening because of that? Remember the story? What ended up happening? They refused to bow. Everybody else bowed, <laughs> and they were left standing, right, out in the open. Um, 
So ultimately, they, the, the, what was to happen was they were going to get thrown into the furnace, right? And then they get thrown into the furnace, and of course, there's Jesus there in the furnace. Go ahead, brother. You got a question? Yeah, I, was, I was just going to mention that it, it's an interesting little side note that Nebuchadnezzar found favor in those guys, so much so that he gave them a second chance. Yes. And when they came, and then they basically said, oh, it doesn't matter what you say, we're not going to bow. Yeah. Our God can save us, and even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow. That's right. And then Nebuchadnezzar's pride you know, got to a level where he what, heated it up seven times hotter and threw him in there. And then I don't, just, the, but, but the cool thing through the whole thing is that God saw something in Nebuchadnezzar that was redeemable and still worked with him, even though he was impulsive and irrational and all these types of things and full of pride. There was still just this little glimmer of hope in him. And then obviously we know that he pretty much wrote, what was it chapter four, was written by mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar himself. So um, kind of cool to see God's working and all that. Not, not only these three young men unwilling to compromise at all. And I think that's one of the key elements of it here is um, their unwillingness to compromise when it comes to worship. And I think sometimes we... Uh, I guess, I guess we do, we compromise in so many ways, you know, oh, well, it's okay if we just do this or that, and the Bible says this, but in this situation, you know, we, 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 we're always just gnashing around in our mind on, on ways to conform to the easy path, even at the expense of, of worshiping God. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Yeah, thanks for your comment. Um, yeah, there's, there's so much to the story, of course, just like, uh, many of the stories in the Bible, but um, so, so, what, so the question again is, what does it teach us for the importance of true worship? Well, we know what happened to them when they got thrown into the furnace, but I think the question that's asked here is what ultimately, what ultimately ends up happening to them? Well, first of all, they worship the one and only true God because they didn't bow down to the image. Um, so I think that because of that, their lives were spared, right? That's one thing that happened. And their lives were spared eternally, right? Um, I'm going to read the bottom of the lesson just briefly. It says, the three Jewish boys obviously took the second commandments as seriously as God has meant it to be taken. After all, it's part of the Ten Commandments right up there with the prohibitions on murder, robbery, and so forth. Uh, worship, proper worship, is so important that in fact it becomes central to the issue in the last days before the second coming of Christ. Thus the Christian education needs to include the whole question of worship. What is it? How do we do it? Why is it important? And whom do we worship? Um, at the bottom of the lesson, it, it, it points us to Revelation 14, uh, of course, the three angels' message. Um, and, you know, oftentimes I say that, and I'll say it again, that uh, we should memorize the three angels message but not just to memorize it but to understand it and if we memorize it we'll have a deeper understanding of what really is going on and why it's so important to the Adventist faith um, so in a nutshell the three angels message is basically pointing to two camps one receives the seal of God the other receives the mark of the beast right and that's that's the, the main focus and what it's really showing, once again, it's showing false worship versus true worship. They're both worshiping, but the problem is one camp is worshiping the way God wants them to worship. The other camp is choosing to worship, we could say, following the tradition, traditions of men or whatever it might be. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it's false doctrine. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment here. So, you know, there's one other thing, if it's all right, I want to interject yeah, you. Yeah, go ahead. The commandment is, goes from the standpoint about idols, even from things below or above. Yes. So we think, well, a statue of Jesus would be nice to be in here. Right. What's the problem with that? The Bible says, in other words, when the Israelites, when Aaron went down and, you know, Moses was up on the mount and they built this idol. Okay. Mm -hmm and so forth. They were actually worshiping God. Yeah, but never a lot of God further than that. But they were worshiping the idol. And what the idol represents is basically framing God in the way we'd like to see him. Mm -hmm.
worship him here in the way that we would like to worship him, and so forth. So that's the problem with idol worship. And what Jesus is always trying to tell people, that God is spirit, okay, and we must worship in spirit. Mm -hmm. And so forth. So the problem with the fact is, is that when you went initially, is that the people were motivated by external things mm -hmm. rather than motivated by the spirit which brings love. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you know, uh, man for some reason always, I even today, I mean, when you think about it, uh, all other religions have some image. They, they think that they, and I, this is the beautiful thing about our God is that and I believe this is par probably part of the reason why we don't have images. And he says, don't make any images, because all the rest of the religions have images. And they worship those images. Our God is a God that is unseen. As you said, he's spirit. And that's the beauty of it. You know, when you think about it, you know, things concerning Jesus, you know, certain dates and events, you know, we don't know anything about it for certain reasons. And the same thing applies to God. Why? You know, we don't see God. We worship him in spirit because he's not like all the other false gods. He's a God that we can't see, and for those reasons. Um, okay, any other comments? Okay, I'm going to move to Monday's lesson. And Monday's heading is, and declare them to their children. Um, so we're going to be looking at Psalm 78, 1 through 17. Uh, we don't have time to read all of it, but if we had done it in our lesson study or if we just briefly look at it now, um, I think we're pretty familiar with what's going on here. But we're going to bring out some of the points is what we're looking at. Um, the first part of it, uh, let me just read a little bit from the top before I go any further. The Psalms in the Old Testament eventually came to play a role in the religious life of ancient Israel. They were recited, sung, often with musical instruments during times of worship, especially public worship, which in the Old Testament was key to the people, or to key to how the people worshipped in general. Israel functioned as a community, and as a community they worshipped together. The Psalms are basically poems, the lyrics to songs. The Hebrew word for Psalms, Tehillim means songs of praise. And when we sing praises to God, whatever else we are doing, we are worshiping the Lord. So keep in mind, that's one of the ways we worship because there's many ways that we give worship to God. And of course, one of them is when we come here and we sing praises to God, this is what God asks of us, one of the things. Um, okay, so the question here, in 78, uh, Psalm 78, 1 through 17, what is the ex essential message here and how does it fit with the role, with the whole question of education and worship? Any comments? Any takers? Okay, well, the lesson tells us that the point here is that whatever else the education of Israel included, it included the t the. It included teaching the children the stories about the Lord's dealing with the chosen nation. Um, I didn't highlight anything here, unfortunately, in it. I thought I did. Um, uh, it says uh, in verse 6, that the gener or let me read 5. It says, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they might arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set their heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. So part of it was that they were to teach these throughout the generations, pass them down, and uh, it, it obviously worked because we still have these writings today, right? And they're still passed down today. And God tells us the same thing. He tells us to teach our children when they're little, raise them up in the ways of the Lord so that when they get older, they won't go astray. And it's not a guarantee, but it's a lot better than uh, letting them go the other way, which I call wild weeds. You know, if you don't cultivate the garden, what happens? You get weeds. And uh, I see a lot of that. Uh, in families today, uh, some in my families. Um, okay, 
So that's what the point of the Psalms was, to remind the people of God over and over of what, had, what God had done for them in the past, what he continues doing for them in the present, teach them to your children, um, so that these things of God would not be forgotten or just disappear. Um, okay, uh, it says, look at Psalm 78, 6 through 17. What were the specific lessons that they were to teach their children? What was the ultimate goal of this education? Um, this one's easy. If you look at the bottom, it pretty much gives the answer. It says, among the goals of education as seen in the text is that the children would learn to trust God and keep his commandments. So that was the whole point of teaching them. It wasn't just to go over these things, just, you know, mundane rituals. It was in order that they would learn how to obey God and to trust God. Any comments? Okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead, brother. Just going back to the story of Daniel. I mean, here we have mm -hmm. these really four Hebrew boys. We Good don't know point. where Daniel is during the time of the, the golden statue. Some people think he's off in a foreign land or something, but... Nonetheless, you know, Daniel and his three companions stood apart from the rest of the Hebrews that were taken captive because most of them did compromise. Most of them ate the king's food, drank the king's wine. Most of them, I, it, it is, I assume all of them except for the three boys, um, bowed down to the golden image. So something that those four Hebrew boys, and I'm including Daniel in this because mm -hmm. I, I would imagine Daniel probably wasn't there when they bowed to the statue. Um, if he was, he must have bowed. But um, they, they did. They held to the things that they were taught as young people, um, even in difficult times. And I think that goes to show the investment that we put into our children as dividends as they get older. And uh, sometimes we don't see that come to fruition. Um, in this case, obviously, they did. But um, it makes me wonder how the other young people were raised or I don't know there's there's a lot to be said for the upbringing of those four young men yeah absolutely that they stood out that's a good point that they stood out amongst I mean why weren't the rest of the Hebrews that were in captivity there uh, not bowing also you know they all compromised uh, yeah sad enough uh, but you know it's an example too of once again, you know, God has his people, but it's always just that little small remnant that, that stays loyal and obedient to God. You know, there's a kind of an interesting thing. I'm taking on Mark's remarks. Let's compare the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's experience with that of Peter's when Jesus was crucified. Peter did, did something opposite. He denied mm -hmm. his Lord, right? Yes. And so forth. So what does that mean here? Uh, and so forth. It means that these three gentlemen were very mature in the faith. Much yeah, advanced than Peter. And so forth. Even though Peter had been with Jesus for three and a half years. Huh. And so forth. And they basically just said, hey, you throw us in the fire of Jesus. If he rescues us, fine. If he doesn't, we are not going to bow down to that image. That shows a tremendous growth and trust in God to get to that point. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. That's I mean, tremendous point, maturity. Yeah. And uh, as far as Daniel is concerned, Josephus, who's a great historian and mm -hmm. so forth, the statement was made by him. Is that in essence that Nebuchadnezzar made it for sure that he was not going to allow Daniel to be at that meeting. He was very close to Daniel. And so he was not about to put him in that position. And he knew what he would do. <laughs> no question about it. Mm -hmm. And so I look at that and it shows, you know, Daniel had tremendous respect for Nebuchadnezzar. And so forth. And the end result of that relationship was a conversion process. Isn't that true? Yes. Yeah. So there's a lot of things you can get out of that story about growth and maturity and so forth. And uh, these three young men had, I thought, got the epitome of what it means to mature in the faith, right? Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I mean, oftentimes we look at people and we expect, you know, we might expect them to be where, where we're at in our walk, perhaps. Or why don't they do this or why don't they mm -hmm. do that? And we've got to step back. Well, number one, we shouldn't be condemning them that's right. Um, because we don't know where they're at in their walk. So that's a good point. Thank you, Chuck. Not to beat a dead horse, but one other comment on that. <laughs> um, another thing that comes to my mind is the character of Daniel. And I, I, I would agree with you. There had to been some reason. The historian that you talked about said that Nebuchadnezzar made it 
he's made the situation so that Danny wouldn't be. That seems very likely to me. Um, but the something about Daniel that we see throughout the entire book of Daniel was that he found favor in all the people that were over him. There was something about his character that was loving and lovable, as Ellen White would say. Um, the most important aspect of a Christian is someone who's loving and lovable. There was something about Daniel. Uh, the, the, the leader of the eunuchs found favor in Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar found favor in Daniel. Uh, later on, then Darius then found favor in Daniel. Every person that rubbed elbows with Daniel, except those who were trying to connive him out of the, you know, they wanted his position, those who were jealous. But they found, they respected him, and they, they were drawn to him. And uh, that's just pretty cool that it, you, show, you just see the contrast of Daniel's refining character um, on Nebuchadnezzar, God working through Nebuchadnezzar with all the, the ins and outs of his interaction with Daniel and the three boys, and the three boys' faith in, in not bowing to the image. You know, the, he, I'm guessing Nebuchadnezzar must have forgotten about those guys and uh, put them in that situation. But their unflinching commitment... And then later we see that all those workings out of God through his faithful ends in the conversion of King Nebuchadnezzar. And him, you know, God had to humble him a little bit more those seven years walking around eating grass or whatever. But long story short is we're going to see King Nebuchadnezzar in the kingdom. And that's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. the power of uh, being a witness for Christ and the best witness is being a living example of how we live our lives. Yeah, yeah, good point. Thank you. Um, okay, is there any other comments before we move on to Tuesday's lesson? Okay. Uh, Tuesday's lesson is in spirit and in truth, and I kind of think this is kind of the focal point of the lesson. Um, so we find in John 4, 7 through 26, the story we're pretty familiar with, most of us, of the woman at the well. And there's so much going on in this narrative. I mean, you can do sermon after sermon on this topic, of course, but we're just going to try and just go through it as quick as possible, but to be able to have a better understanding of what is exactly going on here and taking place. But the question asked when it says, uh, read John 4, 7, 4, 7 through 26, what does Jesus say to her about worship? In fact, how did they get on the topic of worship to begin with? So hold that thought for a moment, and we're going to look at it. We're going to just go over it just briefly. Um, so we know a woman of Samaria comes to draw water. Uh, Jesus was in that region to begin with because he was passing through to get to Jerusalem. Um, I'm not sure how many are familiar with the setup of Samaria and Jerusalem. Uh, Israel, you have all of Israel. Let's say this is all of Israel. You had the northern tribes, which were ten, and then you had the southern tribes. The northern tribes were Samaria. Their capital was Samaria. The southern tribe was Jerusalem, and the capital was Jerusalem. Okay? Um, so let me go on and read a little bit further. So he's in Samaria, and he... It says, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Interestingly enough, he's just saying, give me a drink, right? Um, so keep in mind that, number one, he didn't have anything to draw the water with. Number two, the well was deep, and he didn't have it. So he had no way to get the water, so he needed this woman to help him out. She came to the well to get the water. Interestingly enough, we're going to find out a little bit more about some of the issues here, and hopefully we get a better understanding of what's really going on. But it says, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Well, why aren't they buying food right there in Samaria? Just keep, keep that thought in mind. Nine says, the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Now this Samaritan woman was not only a Samaritan, but she was also an outcast. And also, in, in, in the Bible, in, in times of antiquity, uh, remember that women were also considered second-class citizens. 
Jews did not have any dealings with Samaritans whatsoever. They actually considered them dogs. They and considered them unclean. Okay, so keep that in mind. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, she says. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Um, I'm going to just continue reading because I want to just get to all of this and then we're going to talk about it. I'm going to try to get some of it out as we go through it though. 13 reads, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. I think we kind of understand that pretty much, right? Okay. Uh, 15 says, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. Of course, Jesus knows everything, right? So he's kind of setting her up for something here. And uh, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. So here Jesus is, what, what's he doing? Is he condemning her? This is what I love about Jesus. You know, he doesn't just reach out and ever condemn anybody. Although he is pointing out her sins, right? He, he's telling her basically, you know, you're living in sin. But I love the fact that he doesn't condemn her over it. Just, just the same as the, the woman that was caught in adultery, Amen. right? He tells her, you know, where the where are your uh, accusers? And he says, and I don't accuse you either, right? So Jesus is really just there to help. He's not there to, to give condemnation. Um, but interestingly enough, 19 says, The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Mm -hmm. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where we one ought to worship. So notice number one, she kind of avoids the issue of what he was telling her about her living, her having five husbands and now living with somebody that she's not married to, right? She doesn't even go there. She doesn't even acknowledge it. She kind of diverts the whole topic to a different subject, doesn't she? I mean, look, it says, the woman said to him, number one, she says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. She says, our fathers worship on this mountain. She goes to a topic of worship. Of all things. Why does she go to the topic of worship? Any comments? Okay. There I'm could be a couple it. of reasons. Yeah. This uh, one kind of goes outside of the boundaries a little bit, but that's okay. Or, or maybe she was <laughs> just trying to change the whole topic to begin with. But she started out with saying, obviously she sensed something about him because he knew something about her that nobody else knew, right? That's what impressed her. Right. And, and uh, in fact, that's what led her eventually to the decision she made. That's right. Because she so goes, So now she a says, I don't know this guy, and he doesn't know me, so he must be a prophet. But there's a problem. He's that's also right. a Jew. That's right. Okay? That's right. So she's looking at him like the disciples would have looked at her, <laughs> and so forth. So she says, well, wait a minute. She's going to bring up worship. True worship isn't in Jerusalem. True worship is in Samaria. Yeah. So she's trying to make a point to him, and, and so forth. And so, and as her level of confidence in Christ is starting to grow. Mm -hmm. he's, now he's been elevated to a prophet. <laughs> Ultimately, he's going to be elevated again, right, yes, in this conversation. Yes. I thought it was really good when Jesus mentioned that, because I, I think he knew, without a doubt, that he would impress her with being able to tell what kind of life she was living. Mm -hmm. Not to condemn her, but so that she could say, hey, there's something more to this guy than what, what appears. Yeah, so, yeah. Anyway. and first of all, when, when you go condemning people, I mean, that's one of the Never biggest looks. things I think that most Christians make, especially baby Christians. You know, they're so on fire for the word that they start pointing the finger at other people saying, you need to do this, you need to do that, you're doing this. And that's not the way, what it, what it actually does is put up a wall when you start condemning people. And then your, your witness is of no effect usually. But let me ask you, Chuck, um, so why does she say our fathers worshipped on this mountain. First of all, what mountain is she talking about? 
And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Well, I, maybe somebody else give it a try. Yeah, somebody I'll else want to? I just thought since you were on the topic there that you might. Anybody else want to take it? Not that I know this off the top of my head, but I'm, I'm reading this from the, uh, the notes at the bottom. Uh, the Samaritans worshipped on Mount Gerizim, where they once had a rival temple to the one in Jerusalem. Yes, right. yes, and that's the correct answer. Um, so once again, like I said, we, you know, when I read something, I want to understand. If I don't understand why, then I want to know why. And the answers are always there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's correct. That it, it goes back, first of all, um, let me just break something down, and, and we'll see something from Ellen G. White also. Uh, we first have to determine, number one, what, Samarit what a Samaritan is, yeah. okay? So I'm just going to read from my notes just briefly. Samaritans were a group of people who lived in Samaria. Remember, I said Samaria was the upper region, northern the ten tribes. northern tribes, mm -hmm. and the southern region was Jerusalem, okay? So the Samaritans, uh, they lived in Samaria in an area north of Jerusalem, uh, when Assyria captured the northern kingdom of Israel in 1721 BC, some were taken into captivity. Others were left behind. The ones left behind intermarried with the Assyrians. Mm -hmm. They were both Jew and Gentile. Okay? So this was one of the first uh, uh, captivities was the Assyrian, when the Assyrians came. Uh, and the reason that happened was because prior to that, when you read in the book, in, in uh, First Kings, you find that the northern tribes were rebelling against God. They were wicked, evil. Uh, they would do evil practices and, and, and wicked things, and they would worship idols. And so God said that he was going to let an idolatrous nation come and overtake them because of it. And that's what happened to the ten tribes. Um, so you have the people that are left behind they end up intermarrying with the Assyrians and this is where the Samaritans came out of. They were half mm. Gentile and half Jew. Okay? Uh, they had their own unique copy, which is interesting, of the five books, uh, 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 which you know, the Jews call the Torah, but they claimed that their copy of the five books were more accurate than the Jews' copy. Okay? Um, they, they had their own system of worship as well, completely. Well, I don't know about completely, because uh, it, it was a mixture. What they ended up doing was the Samaritans would actually worship God, but they would also worship idols. Does that go on today mm -hmm. with certain yeah. sects and religions? Yeah. Even in Christianity? That's right. Yeah, it sure does. Uh, the northern tribes of Israel were called Israel, and the, their capital was uh, Samaria, as I mentioned, and the southern was called Jerusalem. That was the capital. Um, the Assyrian Empire fell to the... Now, now keep, keep in mind, because I'm just trying to go through this just briefly. The Assyrian Empire fell to the Egyptians in 612 B.C. The Egyptians were defeated by the Babylonians shortly after, and Samaria be, uh, became a minor capital city of the Babylonian Empire. That was during the Babylonian captivity, which I think we're pretty familiar, most of us, with that, right? Okay, so the same thing was going on through all this time. You had the northern tribes that were gone, the southern tribes remained, and all the people that were left behind when the southern tribes went, again, all these people that were left behind in Jerusalem were the ones that ended up being called Sumerians. I could be mistaken on this, the, the southern tribes, so don't quote me on that. Uh, the southern was also conquered by Babylon. All Israel was known as Samaria at one time. Okay. Um, so, let's, let me just go on with the story. If there's any comments, just raise your hand. Chuck will get to you. Um, so, this is why she says, so, they had their own temple at that time. The Sumerians had, uh, because they had these differences with, with the Jews, they built their own temple, actually opposing the Jewish uh, temple that was in Jerusalem. So, they had their own temple as... as um, uh, Brother Mark mentioned that was in, on Mount Gerizim because they believed that Mount Gerizim was the place where uh, Isaac had actually offered up, or excuse me, Abraham had actually offered up Isaac. Mm -hmm. But the Jews believed that it was what, Mount Moriah? Mm -hmm. So two differences, right? Yeah. 
And so they had their own temple of worship, which was destroyed at one point, and then it was utterly destroyed at another point. And so you had the other mountain and the other temple that was in Jerusalem. Are we clear on that? Everybody understand what I just said with that? Okay. So that's why she says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship, okay? So 21 says, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, which by the way, that's the first time and only time I believe that that word Jesus says, believe me. He usually would say, truly I say to you, or verily I say to you. But in this case, he's saying, believe me. And the reason is because she perceived him as a prophet. So he's saying, well, if you trust me as a prophet, then you, you must believe what I'm going to tell you now. And what he says to her, he says, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem so worship the Father. Nice. You worship what you do not know. Let me back up just a second. So he's saying the time is coming where you're not going to worship there or here. Why do he say that? A couple of reasons. Go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, well, one will be this, is that she was concerned about location. That's what's really key to, to, to religion. Yeah, to and religion. a lot of people get that way That's where they right. think the, the, that the religious place is the place to go to. And I think to. that can be a danger for us. Um, yes. Number one is because if we're Seventh-day Adventists, then we're probably just automatically Christian. Not true. Uh, there are Christians in every denomination. Hold the mic a little closer. Yeah, there's Christians in every denomination. Yes. And he said, Jesus was giving a foundation. He said, the day will come when you worship in truth and in spirit. Spirit meaning the Holy Spirit, that you're inspired in your relationship by the Holy Spirit, which only comes through conversion. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, Jesus said the truth is in the Word, because mm -hmm. it testifies of me, mm -hmm. and so forth. So he took her right to the basic foundation, listen. Don't claim that you're a Baptist, or you're a Jew, or you're a Philistine, or you're an Adventist. Basically, in order to be a Christian, you need to worship in spirit and truth. If you're not doing that, I don't care what you call yourself, it doesn't make any difference. And I think that's, for us today, is what's critically important. And that's why probably in every church service, we should be presenting the foundation as part of our message. And so forth, spirit and truth. Yeah, and that's what the, the heading was on this one. If we go a little bit further, I don't mean to cut you off there, Chuck. Um, no, I'm done. <laughs> okay, but yeah, in 24, he says, uh, or in 23, he says, but the hour is coming, and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such, worship, such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So, yeah, what was he really saying with all that? Uh, spirit and truth. That was the question I was going to ask Chuck, but uh, you already answered it for us. Yes, go ahead, brother. So what about those people? I don't know. You know what about you? those people that have, you know, never worshipped in spirit and truth? For example, they kept Sunday all their lives for the last four thousand, three thousand years, not knowing the truth as we understand it today. And they'll be in heaven, we're told, and they'll, but they didn't worship God in spirit and truth. They worshiped him in spirit, and their heart must have been correct. So how do you explain that? Yeah, I don't think that uh, it has to be both. Because number one, what he's telling her, the reason he's telling her in spirit and truth, because remember, once again, the Samaritans were, they were worshiping God in spirit. I'm not talking about those people whose hearts are not in the right place. They don't know Jesus. They're following right. the law without the knowledge of, of Jesus. I'm talking about those people who are good people mm. who Okay, I know it's... Are we not, are, are, is that the answer? I'm, I'm just projecting. Is yes. the answer maybe we're accountable for what we know and should know and could have known? Absolutely. As opposed to what we actually did? Absolutely, but remember what the three angels' message says in 14, verse 12. What does it say? It says, those, here's the patience of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So the other groups... The other group is not keeping, they're keeping commandments, but not all of the commandments, particularly the fourth commandment. And remember, brother, you know that at some point they will be given that opportunity from the Sabbath keepers to be able to have a chance to get the seal of God. But I'm talking about this passage is for all people. Yes. This was given to us in Daniel's time. 
Yes. But there were multitudes of people that lived the life that they felt was right. And Christ judged that life accordingly, and they will be saved. But they weren't, in fact, keeping the Sabbath, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, we have to be careful that we don't quantify this as a legalistic point of view or a doctrinal point of view, because really what it is, is when uh, David cried out, create in me, O Lord, a clean heart, and renew a right spirit. He had the right order. Mm -hmm. The first order is to create in me a clean heart. Yes. Because our heart is, is, is wicked, and we cannot understand the truth in, the, in a worship in spirit until we clean our heart, which is a motivational thing that we have to come to. And I think that what we have to be careful of is that we sometimes doctrinize this thing too much, and we don't realize it's more of a, a emotional a, a surrender and, and a heartfelt surrender, realizing that our lost condition, just like the woman at the, at the well, she, she, real, she didn't realize when she got there who she was. It wasn't until Christ told her, you're wicked, you haven't been doing well, you have five husbands, that she realized, oh my goodness, this guy really does know me. You know, and so I, I think it's important that we just realize that there's going to be a lot of people in heaven that technically didn't worship God in the true truth because they didn't know it. Yeah, and as you mentioned, the Bible does say that they, they live up to the light that they're given. God winks in the time of ignorance. So yeah, absolutely, brother. Yeah, I'm so glad that, I'm sorry, what's your name? Floyd. Floyd, thank you for asking that question. It's, it's that, Lloyd. That was a, oh, Lloyd? Lloyd, Lloyd yeah. I'm sorry. Um, that was a question that actually was a stumbling block for me in becoming a Christian in that what about those that you know tribe of people on some deserted island that we don't know about who never had the opportunity to hear the gospel or read the Bible or anything like that and uh, it wasn't until I read the desire of ages and this I had this page 638 um, I only know that because this is one of my anchoring points, and it says there, there's a paragraph, and I'm paraphrasing, that there will be basically children of God in the kingdom of heaven that never heard the gospel from human lips, and that they responded to the truth of the Holy Spirit as they witnessed in nature, and God can see in their hearts that they were, they were true to the very tiny little glint of truth that they had in, in seeing God through nature, so much so that he recognized them as his own children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God says that he's put it, we all have that in us. Um, uh, where was I going with this? Uh, God says that it's written on our hearts. So in other words, we, we know right from wrong naturally. I mean, it's very simple. It really is, if you think about it. It's this simple. Ten Commandments is like this. I don't need to know. God just gave us as a reminder the Ten Commandments, but like I said, he said it's already on our hearts. How is it on our hearts? Look, if I lie to somebody, I know I don't like to be lied to. If I cheat on somebody with somebody's wife, I know I wouldn't want that happening to me. If I steal from somebody, so these are just natural things that we ought to know. So you're right when, when God says it, you know, there'll be people that never ever, but because they followed their, their, right. their heart. And, and, and of course the mind would have to go with it too of what is right and what's wrong. But okay. Uh, is there anybody else? Let me get oh, to get, Brother get, Dan real quick because he had his hand up a little while ago. The idea of truth, are we sure that all Adventists, or, or, or the, the Adventists know all truth. Of course not, right? So, can, yes, we, we understand the, the Sabbath, um, but there is so much more to learn. Uh, Pilate asked, what is truth? He uh, unfortunately didn't wait around for the answer, right? right? But Jesus says, I am the truth, yes. the way and the life. So, as we get to know Jesus, the Holy Spirit teaches us more and more truth. Amen. At times of ignorance, God winks, right? So what we understand today is not what we're going to understand tomorrow and, and, and further on. My family is rich. Uh, by the way, today is the 400th anniversary of the pilgrims landing on Plymouth Rock. Mm -hmm. Do they know all truth? No. But they were following their conscience, following so that they could, they, they could uh, worship God 
and freedom. Yeah, let me and just make it. Yeah, I yeah. It, in, in times of ignorance, God winks. Yes. But God does not want to leave us in ignorance. No. Yeah. So let me just make a comment, just real briefly, and then we're going to get to the next uh, uh, person here, real quick. Um, so, in spirit and in truth, remember that they weren't worshiping. They were worshiping in spirit, but not in truth. Just like I said, it goes on today. There's a lot of churches. What is truth? Truth is the word of God, right? Jesus said, I'm the truth. Well, the Bible is Jesus, right? So, spirit, truth. Okay, so the problem was, is like today, we have, there's a lot of churches out there that are teaching false doctrine. So that's not truth. And this is what Jesus is warning about. He says, I need to be, God needs to be worshiped in spirit and truth. So in other words, he means truth according to doctrine. Because there is a lot of false doctrine out there, uh, you know, that teach things that are, like God is an evil God because he's going to put you in hell to burn forever and ever, you know? So these are the things that Jesus was talking about. Who had the next comment? Let's get to the next comment real quick. Yeah. Somebody. Okay, I didn't hear a bell ring yet, so I guess uh, we're still okay. So let me try and wrap it up real quick because I knew this would take a while here on this one. Uh, the middle of the page, it tells us, uh, let me just read Ellen G. White on this just briefly. True worship of the Lord must be in spirit. That is, it must stem from love of God, from the experience of knowing Him personally. The religion that comes from God is the only religion that will lead to God. In order to serve Him aright, we must be born of divine spirit. This will purify the heart and renew the mind, giving us a new capacity for knowing and loving God. It will give us a willing obedience, and that's key right there, is obedience, uh, to all His requirements. This is true worship. It is the fruit of the working of the Holy Spirit. So there you have it, right? Go ahead, brother. Well, the, the thought obedience, right? Mm -hmm. The thought obedience. My, my favorite theologian, uh, uh, Dr. Bonhoeffer, said, only the believers obey and only the obedient believe. In Adventist uh, history, we kind of got up, caught up in the law. And we said, well, you have to follow the law. And it, it became pharisaical because we started thinking, well, we didn't say this, but we started thinking, if we don't follow the law, we're not going to get to heaven, so we need to do this, this, and this, and this to get to heaven. Well, no, you believe in Jesus Christ to get to heaven, and Jesus leads you into obedience. So it gets, it gets backwards what happens. If, if we obey yeah. to try to serve God, we don't believe. It's only the believers that truly obey. Yes, amen, amen. Um, and, and you, do you have a comment, brother? No, just scratching your head. <laughs> okay. Um, at the, I'm just going to read a little bit more. At the same time, worship must be in truth. We must have some correct knowledge of God, of who he is and what he requires of us. In other words, doctrine is involved as well. Uh, I'm just going to read the bottom, and then I, I, we might have to wrap it up pretty quick here. In contrast, truth without spirit can lead to a lifeless formalism, hence we need both. Um, as we read earlier, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, the same thing was going on there, right? They were thinking that everything was an outward form. Um, you know, there was another point there when Jesus said, uh, he said, uh, to the woman, the time is coming, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that he could have been referring to also the abomination of desolation, that neither of those places would be there. And of course, remember, Jesus took everything to the spiritual side. Everything before that they practiced was an outward form of religious practices and uh, tradition. Jesus, when he came and he left, he took everything to the spirit side of everything, of everything. Um, okay, so any other comments on Tuesdays? It's barely Tuesday. <laughs> no? Like I said, there was a lot to cover, and there's a ton of it on there, but we can't cover it all, unfortunately. Okay, um, what time are we stopping to be exactly? 11? 11. 11, so we got like one minute. Um, yeah, Wednesday's lesson was the beauty of holiness. Uh, and uh, it's coming from First Chronicles 16, verse 29. It says, give to the Lord the glory due. 
his name, bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The beauty of holiness, uh, what might that mean? How many takers on that? The beauty of holiness. I mean, if we just think about it. Yeah, go ahead, brother. To me, the beauty of holiness to me means that uh, it's God's character. You know, his beauty, we, we, we worship him, not because we fear him, uh, but because he first loved us, right? Mm -hmm. So the law, even the law is, you know, summarized in, you Holy. know, in love. Yes. And John said, you know, God is love. He didn't say God is loving, but he's an adjective of, you know, but his very essence is love. Yes. And so once we understand that, it's easier for us to relate to one another uh, because it's not the formalism of things we do. God is a relationship, and he asks us to be part of that relationship. Sabbath is a relationship. Hey, spend time with me. All the commandments are relational. You know, they're all relational about what yes, we do. Yes, yes. Okay, let me just read the bottom real quick because it gives us an insight on that too. Um, I like what, what it says. It says, for starters, think about how ugly and damaging, how degrading sin is. And when, you think, when I think about the degrading part, you know, I think of alcohol and drugs, you know, how we end up being, you know, God created us to be these beautiful images in his likeness, but Satan tries to destroy that character, and he does it with things like that, like drugs and alcohol. It says, also, it's hard for us to imagine just how evil, terrible, and degrading the worship practices of the nations around Israel were. Practices that included, of all things, child sacrifices. And no question, these things reflected what people who practiced them were like. Not a very pretty thing, right? So when you think of the contrast, the beauty of holiness versus the ugliness of sin, I mean, just look at the things going around in the world today. You know, it's not very pretty, is it? So when you think of the, it's basically a contrast there of holiness versus uh, sinfulness. Uh, let me just read the bottom part. It says, in contrast, ancient Israel was to be a holy nation separated from the evil customs around them. They were to be holy in their hearts and in their minds. This is what gave their worship meaning and beauty before God. And I'm going to end it right there on that note. And just uh, Let me have a quick word of prayer for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time spent in uh, being able to fellowship on this beautiful Sabbath day to look a little bit deeper into your word, Father. And I, I just pray once again that we will uh, go back and search these scriptures, Father, and just try to dig out as much as possible, Father, because you tell us that you don't want us to be on the surface of, of, of this uh, uh, venture that we're on, Father. You tell us that you want to take us to the deepest depths, Father, and that's where you would have us, Lord. I pray that we would be like the Bereans and go back and search the scriptures to see of what was spoken about and to find the truth and to go into a deeper level of understanding of what it is you truly want us to know, Father. Uh, we thank you for this time spent, Father. I just pray for our, our leaders today, Father, and, uh, and our sermons, and, uh, and I just pray that each one of us will have a blessing today here when we leave, Father. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.